Hi, this is Chris. It's uh, February the 21st. Thank you for joining us for our monthly Connect series for premium members. Um, as we're as I'm making this uh, recording, the S&P is at uh, all-time new highs. So congratulations here. I uh, just wanted a reminder that uh, at Kimball Charting Solutions, we're neither a bull nor bear. Uh, we just uh, seek opportunities and solutions to unique uh, opportunities that the markets will present us. Um, we're going to have some fun today, uh, but we'll, as a reminder uh, for, for all of you that are new, thank you for the new members and the trials that are taking place. Uh, but our, my mentor, Sir John Templeton, uh, came up with this idea that bull markets are born on pessimism, they grow on skepticism, they mature on optimism, and they die on euphoria. So at Kimball Charting Solutions, we're uh, not only trying to help you with the trend, but we're trying to find when trends can be challenged and also maybe when uh, key reversals at, at tops and bottoms can take place. And hence, our favorite strategy is what we call TB&M, which stands for tops, bottoms, and no middles. So as we get into um, this week, I just wanted to, this month's uh, webinar, just kind of wanted to show you uh, where we stand as of uh, today, February the, the 21st, the positions that we have and the positions uh, that are closed. And I'm going to do something a little bit different uh, to start off this month's uh, webinar uh, because the market is obviously in an, an uptrend and um, we're getting close to the end of the month. We're, what, about 10 days or not quite that in, in the month of February, just a week away, excuse me. And so I wanted to start off with uh, kind of discussing the uh, March seasonality plays because uh, it's hard to believe almost the first two months of the year are behind us. Uh, but this looks at the the stocks that traditionally for the last 10 years have done well uh, in the month of March. And again, these are the S&P 500 stocks. Uh, a reminder for our criteria is we wanted to look back 10 years, find stocks that were higher uh, at least seven out of those 10 years. And so one thing that uh, catches my attention this month is that the average return over the last 10 years for the month of, uh, of March for the S&P is a, a sweet uh, 2%. So as we look through uh, a lot of our monthly tables, this is a, an above average uh, number. It doesn't mean that it'll be above average, average returns you know, this year in March, but historically uh, March has been a, a good uh, month for the broad market overall. And then here is the list of uh, the stocks that we found that were up at least 70% of the time uh, over the last 10 years. And again, their S&P 500 stocks ranked uh, on the median return from top to bottom. Now the, the bottom, uh, as an example down here, are the bottom couple that they're in red, they're only in red because they're just the weaker of this group. But obviously, they're all positive numbers, and the lowest number uh, is almost three times the median return of the S&P. So I kind of wanted to show you a couple of charts that are uh, of interest to me uh, that might be of interest to you that are March seasonal plays that some of you might want to even uh, hop on board uh, right now. And, and speaking of that, I've already done that uh, today. One of the uh, stocks on the list is a GME, which is GameStock Weekly. And it's have a, had an average uh, median return over the last 10 marches of just under uh, 12%. And uh, the thing that caught my attention is, as you can see, the stock has uh, fallen dramatically, almost from the $50 range to currently just around 26 But it uh, had fallen or declined more than 50% inside this potential bullish descending uh, falling wedge. And so we're seeing an attempt at the arrow to break above this. So um, call me anxious or whatever, jumping the gun. But regardless of the, whether this was or was not a March seasonal stock, I like what I see here, everyone, from uh, it's gotten hit hard and it's attempting a, a breakout. And so uh, I am long at, at this time as of this morning. And then we have a fairly tight stop right below the bottom of the falling wedge. So again, this is a, a March stock that I, I like a little ahead of time, and I wanted to give you a heads up to that. Uh, another stock that's uh, done well in the month of, of March is uh, C, uh, CBRE Group, and the symbol being CBG. Uh, this is a weekly chart uh, going back to 2011, so it's, it's about a six-year time frame. But you'll notice that on average it's made about 8% of the month of March, 
and it's attempting a, uh, a dual breakout above two uh, channel resistance levels. So um, don't own this at the time, but I wanted to let you know that this was a pattern. I, I put together a, a large dashboard of the March seasonal strong uh, stocks, and I'm just going to share a few of them that I really like the looks of. And so not an owner of this, but I like what I see, and a breakout above this dual um, resistance would be a positive for CBG. And again, its average uh, return in the month of March is around 8%. Uh, a small company called Apple. Uh, Apple's been in the news, obviously it's been done late, but it's also on the list with an average uh, uh, March gain of almost 10%. So um, the very uh, top red horizontal line is the, uh, this is a weekly chart, but that's based upon the highest daily tick, and you can see in the upper right in red the 134.52, that's where that line comes into play. So Apple's doing well, it's breaking out uh, above that, uh, so we have a, a positive breakout taking place, and uh, typically a good seasonal pattern in, in front for Apple. For those of you that uh, own it, this is a positive. I'm um, going to be looking at getting into this. I'm just trying to look for some things that maybe even might have greater alpha than Apple, but there's nothing bad that I see. And uh, if you like this idea, I would just put the stop uh, a couple of percent below that 132, 134.52 level. Uh, nextly is a Corning, symbol GLW, another um, March strong stock with an average gain of around 9%. Now this chart's looking back a little bit further. It's going back what, about 11 years. So the red dotted line is placed upon the 2006 high. You can see that uh, GLW is doing well in the last few weeks, pushing above the, the top of a, a, um, an ascending triangle, which is a, a positive. The horizontal blue line, uh, it, it's just under it right now from the 2008 highs. So if it can clear, you know, just uh, what, not even another dollar, excuse me, that would be uh, not even another dollar, um, that it would be a positive uh, breakout getting above the 2006 highs. So this is another stock I wanted you to see that uh, if you would go along here, I'd put a, a fairly tight stop, I'd put a stop just below the 26th level. Um, but if it can get above this breakout in 2006, it'd be a, a real positive for this historically strong stock in March. So I wanted to um, <clears throat> now kind of look at the, the interest rate picture. and It interests me for just a couple of reasons. As, as you know, uh, we like to find some extremes, and so when it comes to extremes and sentiment, this is probably one of the easier areas for any of us to, to grab a hold of. But I don't want to make a case ever that you know, should we trade based upon sentiment alone? And the answer would be no. We're going to use price as our barometer, but when we can see some potential interesting uh, power to pattern setups with sentiment at extremes, that definitely is of interest to us. And so the first three charts here are just going to be some sentiment thoughts. This is the sentiment on the 30-year uh, bond, and as you can see in the lower right, the percent of bond bulls is pretty darn close to zero. So I highlighted a few extremes uh, in 2010. Uh, you'll see that when it was down to the 20 area, it was a fairly decent buy point for bonds, and also 2013, another time period where bonds rallied for a while. On the flip, um, for those of you that have been members since uh, last year, uh, last summer in July, we shorted bonds. Part of the reason was obviously a, a pattern. That was the first point, but then sentiment came into play that you can see there was almost 100% bond bulls last July. So it's, it's interesting what, uh, what seven, eight months can change in, in this picture. So historically, bonds have been closer to lows when sentiment is down here than highs. On the flip side, this is uh, the 10-year Treasury, the hedger's position. This is a chart going back in the lower left to 2009. So as you can see that um, right now, they, uh, this is a crowded trade uh, when we shorted bonds uh, last July. You can see there was another crowded trade on the flip side, but right now I believe uh, one can say is the most amount of people betting that bonds will fall or slash interest rates will rise in the history of the 10-year note. So um, take note, this is a, obviously a huge extreme taking place. 
So the surprise, you know, here would be that bonds rally or interest rates fall. That would surprise the crowd the most. On the flip side, excuse me, this is the same chart. Uh, again, I apologize for that. Again, this is um, a huge majority of people are bearish uh, bonds. It's just a, a little closer look at that same thing. So this is, um, you know, one of the narratives right now is uh, with a new administration. Uh, one of the, the narratives would be uh, growth, uh, base, you know, materials and steel uh, should do well. Stocks should do well, and inflation uh, should pick up. So right now, uh, that's uh, I would have to say, I, I, I'm humbly we don't know if it's going to continue, uh, but humbly I, I believe that's the easy narrative to pick up off of the street at this time. So we have to sit back, and I always. I don't like the thoughts behind it, but the, the thought is, you know, it's not the bullet that you see that kills you. It's the ones that you don't and that surprise you. So right now the surprise trade would be a break of that narrative. But outside, regardless of the narrative of the, the popular, I'm not trying to find any excuses why things are taking place. This chart does ha have my attention. Uh, this is the uh, TIP, T-I-P, the Inflation Protected uh, Bond ETF ratio uh, tip TLT and historically when this is going down it means tips are weaker or society's thoughts on inflation are subdued or they don't believe in it you can see then there's a fairly sharp rally in uh, the ratio meaning that tips uh, are, are gaining uh, more than TLT and so uh, this ratio has remained in a strong downtrend inside channel 1 uh, since 2010 uh, creating a sense of overall a deflationary uh, concept or message you know from this indicator but right now you can see it too that it's testing a triple breakout level so right now this is uh, historically over the last seven years th this chart would say this is where inflation has tended to peak this is where people have got have been bought or bought into the idea that inflation is going to pick up speed only to let them down uh, what three two different major times in the last uh, seven or eight years so regardless of what we accept or don't accept is the narrative out there if we would have a breakout of two it would suggest uh, some growth and some inflationary bent uh, I'd suspect that if this takes place you'd see some strength in commodities and weakness in bonds but right now, so far, uh, the trend would be that this is a counter trend rally and a longer term downtrend in the inflationary picture. So this, again, would be really big for uh, longer term uh, portfolio construction if we'd have a breakout at two. This uh, looks at uh, TLT uh, over the last uh, nine years. And uh, you can see it's overall in a, a, a rising channel. Uh, this past summer, we shorted uh, TLT at the top. TLT has suffered a pretty large decline. And then really over the last few months, it's been fairly choppy inside what appears to be is this narrowing pennant pattern. So the surprise, uh, the non-surprise to society is what the society is betting is that the support is going to give way. The surprise would be to the upside um, with everybody betting that uh, bonds are going to fall in price, the surprise would be if this we had an upside breakout. A long bond bonds would get hit hard. AGG would fall much less than TLT. So um, right now, I'm playing a, a low standard deviation play of long bonds. I uh, haven't made, I think, up maybe half a percent. And um, so with that, um, we'd add a dividend to it. So maybe the position's up 1%. So not much to brag about you know, in either way. But this is a look at if uh, you're aggressive and you like the idea of bonds, uh, this would be something to keep a close eye on. And this is ZROZ which is the 25-year zero coupon ETF. It has uh, a, a lot of um, standard deviation to, uh, to its play.
I'm sorry for that little hiccup there, everyone. But ZROZ, if uh, you're a believer in uh, interest rates falling and bond prices rallying, this would be one of your higher standard deviation plays that you can get in the ETF world. So as you can see, ZROZ is testing falling resistance above six-year rising support. So if it does uh, take out that resistance, it'd be something definitely that would interest me, especially with how uh, crowded the trade is. Here's just a little reminder. This is a three-pack of uh, interest rates. The left chart is the 10-year uh, yield. The middle is the 30-year. And on the right is TBF, which is the inverse uh, ETF that we went and bought here last summer in July, and we sold into strength, and then it's faded some down. So none of these have broken out of longer-term established falling trends. You can see at the top that relative momentum is uh, lofty at some of the higher levels that we've seen in a long time. So uh, no breakouts have taken place, no confirmation of uh, the reflationary trade is on, but that would be the message regardless of momentum if resistance would be taken out. So if the 10 and 30 would break uh, these long-term uh, falling resistance channels, I would look to be going back to buy a TBF if that takes place. So this is a, another kind of look at an interest rate play, uh, which is uh, IYR real estate. And so historically, when rates have uh, risen, real estate has struggled. And so uh, whether that's still the case or not, the bottom line is um, IYR doesn't have a lot to brag about for longer term returns. It's not near its uh, all time high. You can see it's about $79 and it's been as high as uh, 87 over time. But right here looks to be the potential of a bullish ascending triangle with a, a breakout above the top of this pattern. And remember that a bullish ascending triangle two thirds of the time uh, suggests that prices will rise. I did a measured move on this and so the measured move calculation comes in that on an upside breakout, the measured move would suggest around a 9% gain in uh, IYR. So for those of you that uh, are, are, have sector plays in your 401ks uh, you know, at work or just one of the S&P uh, plays, uh, you'd be picking up uh, IYR with a stop at the top of the ascending triangle. And uh, if, it, if it would come true uh, on the measured move, we'd be suggesting almost a 9% gain plus dividends. So we're starting to see a little bit of upward movement break out to the upside in a, a play that is traditionally um, uh, more in favor of falling rates than rising. So turning to the stock market indices, I think you know this can really this chart, regardless of any index, can just say a ton all by itself, and that's why I wanted to lead off this way. This is the advanced decline line over um, you can see the past what, 14 years, and since 2008 or 9, and this is the common stock only advanced decline line. So this, uh, in looking at it this way, it's removed any uh, bond funds from the NYSE. But you can see in the upper right, it's at all-time highs. Uh, not di diverging against the market. The risk on trade wants to see this moving up and it's, it's accommodating. This is a, a continued a positive message taking place from here. This is just a little more a micro look at the AD line, including uh, everything. It's not the common stock only, it's including all issues, but you can see this is on a daily basis and it just continues to uh, push strongly higher. So this is definitely a risk on message that's coming from lifting up the hood and looking at the advanced decline line. Looking at the big snapshot, this is the Dow on the left with the S&P on the, the right, the familiar chart where we've applied the Fibonacci levels to the 2007 highs and 2009 lows on each. Uh, both uh, meandered and struggled to get above the 161 levels this past year, and then once they started pushing above it and used the old resistance as new support, you see a quality push uh, higher. I applied the 261 levels to, to both of these just for future uh, reference. You know, you could have applied these clear back in 2009, excuse me, didn't mean to hop there. We could have applied these obviously in 2009 and so most likely this was a surprise to see how high this could go. But just for reference points, the Dow's uh, 261 FIB level based upon the 2007 highs and 2009 lows comes into play at 20, Dow 25,000. 
and that seemed pretty high at Dow 20,000, and now we're approaching almost Dow 21,000 as we speak. And then on the right chart being the S&P, similar looking pattern with the 261 Fib level coming into play for the S&P at around 3,000. So continued strength after almost a 15, 18 month sideway pattern just below the 161 level has taken off since then. A couple of uh, long-term indices, this is the Russell on the left, the Dow Transports on the right, both are in uh, positive uh, upside uh, trends, there's no doubt uh, about that, but they are, there's no but about it, but they do have a, a what I would want to call a challenge point to the trend. So uh, the Russell has been in this for since the late 2000s, and you can see it's testing the top of this channel. Uh, there's no reason that it can't break out, but this is a place where the risk on trade would not want to see some weakness take place. And then the transports are, are doing well. Uh, the one thing I did notice in, in 2006 and 7, there was a, a double high with a little bit higher second high, and then it turned into some weakness. So the, the transports is trying to break that pattern. Right now, the, the, the odds would be that it, that it will, but this is a challenge point that I wanted to share with you that the risk on trade would not want to see weakness take place here. Um, one of the things that we share in our weekly uh, global dashboards is the equal weight, which is the S&P uh, ETF RSP, uh, and then we divide it by the cap weight, which is the SPY, and this is a look since uh, 2003. But you can see in the upper right, this isn't any uh, terrible news whatsoever, but uh, the risk on trade does want to see this ratio continuing to head up in which it has uh, since the 2016 lows, or uh, uh, roughly a year ago. But you do see that there's a little bit of divergence taking place. This isn't anything major, but the risk on trade would want to see this stay above the blue support line and particularly the green. If this continued to fade, it would send a concerning message to the risk on trade. So this is a, a double, double chart of, of ratios, but it's the same chart on the left, which is RSP, SPX that we just looked at. But this is on a, a daily basis, just looking at a little bit closer. That we're just seeing this small divergence of lower highs taking place, but the ratio is still above uh, highs where it started uh, the beginning of the year. And so uh, the risk on trade wants to see this continued higher. On the right is the discretionary staples, the XLY, XLP ratio, and you see that there's uh, been uh, potentially just some lower highs take place from the 2016 and 2017 highs. So again, the risk on trade wants to see both of these heading up, and we were just seeing a, a soft or slight divergence uh, of late in both of these. So we're going to take a, just a, a couple of minutes and look at sentiment. Um, Sentiment sticks out to me. This is a, a what a seven-year look at the CNN fear greed uh, uh, ratio or index, and again that the market is tip, typically um, momentum or is getting greedy if it's above the red dotted line. And this is from Sentiment Trader and through uh, CNN. And then the market is of lower risk or undervalued when it's down here. So uh, the, the indicator is not at the highest uh, numbers by any stretch in the last uh, seven to ten years, but it is lofty. And so historically, markets have, as you see, have not peaked at this, but they have uh, tended to slow down their momentum or move a little bit sideways when it's at this level. This one has been getting a lot of uh, uh, attention or talk, and, and what this chart is, is about the number of 1% up or down days over the previous 200 trading days. So the top chart's the S&P. The bottom chart, again, is the number of days that have, have uh, the markets not had a 1% up or down day. And the thing that just caught my eye was when it was very volatile, you can see in 2003 after the terrorist attack, you had a, a lot of 1% uh, days. The market obviously was much closer to a low than a high. And you can see in 2007, it just continued to, uh, this, this indicator continued to drop and drop, and this was the, the lowest level that it hit in May of 2007. In other words, the market was just fairly boring and choppy up here, but it, obviously it ended up being closer to the top. And then again, at the 2009 lows, you saw a lot of volatility, and again, that was much closer to the low than a high. And so uh, this past um, 
last fall, or excuse me, last spring, almost a year ago, you can see where there was some volatility taking place, and that was a, a pretty decent time to be uh, buying into the market. And now we're seeing that the indicator is back at 2007 uh, levels again. This doesn't mean a top is here in play, folks. It just it for sure means that we've had a, a, lot, a lot of quietness, not any big moves. But this caught my attention that uh, this is one of these charts right now that it doesn't matter until it matters. Right now, this doesn't matter with the trend being up. But if we see this volatility start picking up, we might revisit this chart because it could sure matter. This is uh, the top chart is the S&P over the last 13 years. And then the bottom is the percent of bulls from the Investors Intelligence Sentiment Survey. And so, uh, as, as with most, if you have a lot of bulls, the market can be historically closer to highs or lows. So I put a couple of the red bars in, which uh, highlighted the 2007 high in the S&P. And then back in 2014, uh, when there was 62% of bulls, and, and this is uh, from Charlie Bigelow that puts out just, Charlie does such a, um, a great job in, in charting. So we can see that we're back at 62% bulls again, and markets have historically been much closer to lows when you see very few people in the survey bullish. So, or just very few that are bullish. You can see these were in the 22 and 25% range at the significant lows of 2009 and this past 2015-16 uh, lows. So again, this is a, another one of those, <clears throat> excuse me, it doesn't matter until it matters, but we do see quite a few people uh, bullish at this time, uh, and it's what close to the levels that we've only seen three times um, since 06. So in, this is only the third time it's been up here in the last decade. One of the things that uh, kind of caught my attention is this is the weekly equity uh, inflows or outflows to mutual funds. And um, it's interesting that it, uh, mutual funds have now had the first inflow in a positive way in the past few years inside the, the red circle. Um, so it, it does show we know that uh, this is not a true picture that includes uh, ETFs. From what I have seen in, in this, this is a weekly mutual fund outflow. But the bottom line is, is a lot more money for a few years has been flowing out, and this is the first time that money's actually started flowing back in from a mutual fund basis. This is a smart money, done money, a confidence indicator. You can see in the lower right, it's fairly low markets uh, when this indicator is high, have historically been closer to bottoms than tops. And the flip side, as you can see several times uh, down through here that the, the number was low and it did not stop the market from going up when the trend was solid. Again, this is one of those that doesn't matter until it matters, but there is quite a few people that are uh, on the dumb money, smart money. This is one that where this indicator is, markets are typically closer to a high than a low. Another one that's uh, uh, caught my attention, this is the XIV, this is the inverse fear ETF, and you can see that it's uh, done well since uh, one year ago uh, when uh, stocks and crude oil were both uh, falling hard and a lot of the world wondered if crude oil was heading closer to twenty dollars than the fifty dollars that it is now as crude has rallied so have uh, stocks and so has the XIV and so it's interesting that if one takes the um, highs of uh, what 2015 and the lows in 2016 on XIV and applied Fibonacci it's at a, a, a key uh, potential uh, extension level. Uh, right now the trend is up in uh, XIV, which means fear is falling. Most likely the market's doing well. Uh, you can see that momentum is the highest ever in the history of XIV, which hasn't been around all that long, everyone. I think it's just like six years. But it's obviously a, a point that uh, the risk on trading stocks would not want to see XIV turn weak here. Just a quick look at the, the metals uh, complex. This is the same uh, chart uh, twice. Um, and I apologize for that piece in, in the middle, everyone. But this is the uh, dollar gold ratio. The left chart goes back a couple of decades. When the ratio is falling, that means gold is stronger than the dollar or the dollar is weaker than gold. And that's uh, a positive when that is taking place in the metals trade. This is a negative when gold is stronger. Um, then, excuse me, this is when the dollar is stronger than gold, 
and this uh, cluster of potential resistance that took place at one uh, up here uh, took place in late December, and that's when we shorted, or excuse me, longed GDXJ because this uh, index looked like it could fall off, which would be a positive for the, the metals complex. And so we took the most aggressive trade possible. And so far, you guys all know that, guys and gals, that uh, GDXJ has done, done well. Um, it will we'll have owned it, if we continue to own it, uh, a week from now, we'll have had it two months. But it's up right now around 39% in the last seven weeks. So this uh, indice, you can see in the upper right, uh, has chopped sideways for the last few weeks. Again, this is a weekly chart. And at that same time, you see that uh, the same thing has happened in metals. They've softened uh, a little, and so have the mining shares. So again, what it, to be long, uh, the miners and metals, you want to see this continuing to decline. This is a, uh, a long-term chart of silver and gold. And the risk on trade in metals wants to see this fall. So you can see that. Uh, different times when this ratio has peaked and then declined. That was a good time for both metals, but especially silver. So you can see that silver, um, the gold-silver ratio, excuse me, is in an uptrend, which is not a positive for the metals. But if support would break here, uh, this would send a, a very positive me message to silver, gold, and the miners. So a key support test in the the gold-silver, and I apologize, this should read uh, the other way around, the gold-silver ratio. I apologize for that. So when this is moving up, gold is stronger than silver, and when it's falling, silver is stronger than gold. So the long um, metals trade wants to see a support break here. This is a look at uh, just the ETFs themselves, a little closer. This is SLV, GLD, and the long metals trade, long gold, silver, and miners, wants to see a breakout here. Uh, as you can see, it's been confined to this falling channel for the last uh, seven years. Uh, and each time it's uh, hit this resistance, it's backed off. Maybe the third time's a charm, folks. But if we would see a breakout here, if you're an aggressive player, you'd want to, uh, on the most, uh, the largest standard deviation, you'd want to look at a purchase of GDXJ or silver over gold or GDX. But if we have a breakout here, all of them, gold, silver, and the mining minor stocks should do well. So again, this is one of the, uh, a rare test that's only taken place a few times in the last seven years. This is the GDXJ, GDX ratio. To be long the miners, you want to see this ratio uh, going up. And so it is testing. Uh, we, we bought at this rising channel uh, right here at about Christmas. And it has had a sharp rally, and now it's testing falling resistance similar to what we saw with SLV and GLD. So if we would see a breakout here, it would send a very positive message to the mining complex, and I would be picking up some more if we see a breakout. This is the Swiss franc. The Swiss franc and gold have a fairly high correlation with each other. The concern that I would have here that I want to see something break if you're a risk on trade in the metals is this, the franc, appears to be forming a descending triangle. And this de descending triangle historically is a, sending a bearish signal two-thirds of the time. So with all of the ratios the, that we looked at earlier in the metals complex up against resistance, the one thing that you'd want to see is the franc breaking out. And uh, historically, the metals have run out of gas and disappointed the bulls here over and over for several years. So this is a key piece to really watch. We continue to update you know, you and all the metals uh, members each week. But what would be concerning here is if this pattern plays out, this is billions of free thinking people are making this pattern. If this pattern plays out, it suggests that the franc falls, and it falls roughly 15 percent. And so if, if the franc would fall 15 percent, historically the metals would at least fall that same amount. So this is a big deal you know, here. Uh, in the 97 to 100 level on the franc. Um, but the long trade wants to see the franc break out. If we would see uh, the franc break support and starting to see some weakness in the miners, 
I would look at uh, shorting silver uh, by ownership of ZSR. Uh, this is the uh, GDXJ chart itself. You can see it remains still in a falling channel. We bought at what I perceive to be a support uh, around Christmas at 1 when we've seen the rally and we've sold into strength. If uh, GDXJ would uh, break out at, at 2, it would sure be something that somebody would want to own. Right now we're just uh, sitting back with a small exposure that uh, we still have from the purchase around Christmas. Quick look at the crude oil complex. Uh, right now, speaking of crowded trades, uh, right now we have the most crowded trade in the history of crude oil. In 2014, this is when uh, many people were very confident, it was the most crowded trade. There was tons of bulls, which ended up being bearish for crude oil. We know the, the after effect of that. One year ago, um, in February of 2016, you can see that the trade had, had flipped the other way. Uh, and now we see that the trade is back, that there uh, are more people bullish crude oil than ever in the history of crude. So from a crowded trade, a decline in crude would surprise people. This is something that I uh, found, this is from uh, Bloomberg, it was kind of interesting. I talked about the boring trade, and this is a look at uh, West, West Texas Intermediate, that's the WTI in the upper left, is in one of the narrowest trading ranges since 2004. So this is like a 13-year-old chart, and you can see in the, in the lower right that uh, crude has been very narrow of late, causing this to go down. Now, in and of itself, I, I don't know that that means a, a ton, but I did play around, and I apologize how busy this is, but let's just kind of go through this. This is the same chart that we just looked at, the, the boring narrow trading days. This top chart here is the crude oil fear index, and that symbol is the OVX, and then the bottom chart is crude oil. And uh, so what I noticed was at the high in 2014 and the high in 2015, you can see that, uh, that this indicator, in other words, narrowness in ranges had taken place, and you can see where the OVX was, and that, so now we're seeing narrowness in range again uh, right up against this falling resistance line that's been in place for seven years with OVX being low. So just because this has been a boring trade does not e equate to bearishness. Um, quite the contrary, a breakout above this line would be a, potentially the breakout of the neckline that we have talked about since last summer um, in, in the crude oil complex. So this is a big one as crude oil and stocks don't always remain highly correlated, but they have the last couple of years. So this is a big resistance test at two as there's boredom in the marketplace. The last few times that boredom and resistance took place and fear was low, crude ended up being soft. So this is a huge ripple effect for what I feel is one of the most important commodities in the world. Some countries even trade this almost like a currency. So it's a, a big, um, price test for crude, and obviously uh, if crude would break out here, I imagine it would solve, we'd see some probably positive movement take place in crude. So a, a huge test, huge test. Um, and speaking of, of this market, uh, traditionally we've shared this, if you've been a member for the last several years, we're in the positive season for gasoline. And the, the, you see in the, the lower left that the three best months for gasoline are historically in February, it rallies almost 7%, in March, close to 12 and again in April, almost 7 So if we put those you know, together, we're above a 20% uh, average return uh, for gasoline in that window. So we're in the positive uh, window. I haven't went and bought it uh, so far because of this pattern, but we may be uh, really uh, picking up or being a buyer of UGA. This is the UGA uh, gasoline ETF on a weekly basis, and you can see that it's been inside this rising channel since June. But this month so far, it has not reflected any seasonal strength. It's actually been the opposite. And so gasoline UGA is testing uh, the short-term rising channel support this week as we speak. So I've set an alert up for myself that if UGA would break above this blue uh, falling 
uh, line which could be forming a bullish falling wedge. If there's a break above it, I want to be a buyer because the pattern would be there and also the seasonality would be a positive. So real quickly, just looking at, this is a, a, a chart that we've, from back in, in February, or January, excuse me, last month, and, but not much has changed. But I just wanted to keep this long-term perspective that the this price point in, in uh, the U.S. dollar continues to be a biggie. As the trend is up and it's testing two overhead resistance lines are right here. Now we're going to look at uh, the dollar on a current and much more updated but I wanted you to look at this you know, chart that's, what, 30, 35 years in length, and it's a monthly basis chart, why this becomes such a big deal. Because if this breaks out here, it's going to give it some freedom to really run. And, and that could uh, provide a lot of strength to the dollar. It would encourage buying to the, towards the dollar, and obviously would have a big impact on foreign currencies. So again, what the dollar you know, does here is, is highly critical. Here's a much closer uh, look, and the 100 level is big. We've been sharing this you know, for a while. That the 100 level uh, last year in 2015 was resistance. It broke above it, and then recently it's come back down to test it as support, and now it's pushing you know, higher. So uh, historically, I'm not a, a bull or a bear of commodities. The thing that just interests me about commodities, when you look back, is what asset class has done the worst over the last three, four, and five years. What asset class has had the worst five, four, and five years in the history of, of that asset class? And it, it's commodities. And a lot of that uh, weakness has had to do because of dollar strength. And so if commodities, if you know the narrative is the world is going to grow, um, most likely one of the truisms would be is commodities ought to head along and, and grow with it. So uh, a big test uh, this week, uh, this is a chart as of today, the dollar is attempting to break above um, this falling resistance line, which historically has put some pressure on the commodities themselves. Um, to finish up, just a couple of stocks. Uh, this is a Walmart that we picked up uh, last week. This was sent to you this morning before uh, pre-market. But since then, uh, earnings have come out, and Walmart is attempting to, to break above falling resistance at one. So this is a possibility of obviously a, a large uh, company in America, retail oriented that's struggled for a couple of years. This has a potential to be a bull flag that's attempting a breakout at one. And then the last chart, uh, something that's been uh, the old, one of the hardest hit stocks uh, outside of penny, some penny stocks that have struggled, um, is uh, VRX, Valent Pharmaceutical. As you can see, in 2015, it was just trading as high as 240, and recently was uh, um, around the 15, or excuse me, almost got down to the $11 range. So regardless of how you look, it's down more than 90%. The trend is easily down. It's an ugly chart, but there's a chance of a bullish falling wedge is taking place um, with a small a crack to the upside taking place at the arrow. I did buy a small half position, as I shared earlier today. This should be just for aggressive investors. Um, I know this, this company has uh, lots of troubles. I'm not trying to uh, say that they don't by any stretch. You know, the, there's obviously troubles when your stock falls 90%. But we're just trying to look from a TV and M, the tops, bottoms, and no middles, a, a potential of a rally that could take place you know, here. So I want to continue to thank you for uh, your membership for the fun and exciting things and the messages that we're hearing you know, from you. Thank you for the, the new, uh, new members that we have and the trial members. It's very uh, humbling to, to have all of you, you know, on board. So best wishes and I'll see you uh, in a couple of weeks.